1981, I was uh, in the second grade of an optometry school, second year student. Uh, I was at the Eye Institute doing uh, community screenings. There were no patients. Somebody came in and said, Dr. Catania needs a uh, model for a series of slides he's taking. Would anybody be interested? And I said, I'll do it. So I took out my contact lenses and um, Lou demonstrated just about everything you can do to a pair of eyes. He uh, showed how to do uh, lavage. He showed how to put in ointment. He showed how to put in drops. He showed how to do everything. Cotton wisp test for corneal sensitivity. Um, after a while, my, my eyes started getting really, really red and really, really irritated. I'll tell you what hurt the worst was corneal lavage. Uh, Jane Stein was having trouble getting the shot, so he was uh, literally lavaging my eye for about a minute and a half. And I think they knocked off a lot of epithelial cells in the process. So then my eye got so red, eyes got so red that he said, this is great. It looks just like a, a, a real red eye. So there, there's actually a slide in uh, Lou's uh, practical hint series, I think, and it says conjunctivitis. And um, it was iatrogenic conjunctivitis because uh, it was irritation brought about by the doctor messing with my eyes. But uh, the one that's shown a lot, most of all, is this one about feeling the lymph nodes. And I, I always chuckle because I'd be at continuing education and this slide would come up all the time. And one time I was sitting a couple seats away from a guy and he literally uh, was doing this. He's looking at me and looking at the at this slide in uh, the picture. And uh, I said, yeah, that's me. Yeah, so then, uh, then Dr. Catania is, uh, looks at my corneas and he says, wow, we've really done a number on your uh, epithelium here. He said, I think we better cycloplege you so we don't induce an iritis. So he went ahead and cycloplege me. And then um, after that, I think somebody else, I don't think it was him, I think uh, somebody else came in, one of the residents or one of the technicians, and gave me a, a tube of uh, broad spectrum antibiotic and said, put this in your eye for the eyes for the next couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell them that I was driving to Virginia that evening, so I had a three and a half hour drive. I just drove very, very carefully and uh, it worked out fine. The next day my eyes were back to normal. Lou is just, uh, Lou is just a breath of fresh air. He, he just has such a positive outlook and uh, such an infectious enthusiasm for uh, the profession of optometry. Uh, during my time at uh, Pennsylvania College of Optometry, I, it was easy to get overwhelmed with all the material we had to learn and whatnot. And uh, you, you always had a sense that Lou was on your side. <laughs> so thanks, Lou. And then later, I got to know Dr. Catania because I was the education director for the Armed Forces Optometric Society. And Lou was kind enough to come on multiple occasions and speak for us. There was one uh, lecture that he, Lou got stuck somewhere. The meeting was in uh, Shepherd Air Force Base and Lou was stuck at an airport due to weather, I believe. And um, he actually presented an entire lecture from a phone booth. That was the famous AFOS phone booth lecture. So they had his slides in the auditorium. They put those up and Lou just narrated from the phone booth. Uh, kind of interesting. He likes to talk about that. Uh, I, w I wanted to do an interview with Lou, but uh, somebody beat me to the punch. There's an interview, I'll post a link where he talks about stuff. And uh, he mentions that uh, he's very thankful to um, Dr. John Crozier for uh, letting him into the school. And uh, I, have to, I have to echo that same comment. I'm very appreciative. Who knows where I'd be if it wasn't for Dr. John Crozier. But uh, I titled this, uh, Thanks, Lou et al., because there were so many other good instructors as well. And uh, I don't think we, I know I didn't thank them enough. Um, I don't think a teacher ever gets up and uh, says, uh, I want to make the students' lives miserable today. But sometimes there was sort of an us versus them mentality in school. They, they hold the power of the, of the grade book. And some of these things are subjective. You know, a good instructor will uh, share their mnemonics with you. I remember, I believe it was Dr. Carroll said that, uh, talking about the inferior and superior bleaks, only inferior people extort money. Boom, you know, you got it. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Academia is kind of a strange world. Uh, I know just about it from the outside looking in. Right after I graduated from optometry school, I was at the Academy poster session, and I, I noticed there were so many uh, posters from uh, PCO faculty. And I mentioned it to one of the younger uh, 
faculty members, and she said to me, it's the only way we can get a, get a raise. We've got to publish, we've got to do papers, we've got to do lectures, we've got to do poster sessions, so interesting. My friend Joe taught at a school for a while, and um, the, the movie Paper Chase had come out a few years before, and I think Joe borrowed a lot of ideas from that. He literally studied the names of the people before the first day of class, and he knew them by name. He was calling them by name on the first day of class. <laughs> Can you imagine? My attitude was, I want to keep a low profile and just get through this and not ask questions. And in retrospect, I think that was uh, probably a mistake. Uh, after all, the teachers are there to instruct us. So um, I kind of wish I'd asked a few questions here. That you don't want to be a pest and ask them everything because you want to show that you did the reading. But uh, you're paying them. So um, you know, the, a teacher could tell a lot about you by the questions you ask, if you ask intelligent questions or not. I certainly wouldn't ask everything. They're going to they're gonna not appreciate that either. Yeah, one time in Denver, I was shadowing an ophthalmologist, and he even said, uh, he, was, he was complaining a little bit because I never asked him any questions. <laughs> um, he was a friend of my father's and a uh, brilliant ophthalmologist. One time, Joe um, gave his class an assignment. It's to write that proverbial letter to a uh, referral of a patient. And he said, just slip it under my door at 10 o'clock. So he went to his office early, and uh, he watched the clock. And at precisely 10 o'clock, he stuffed a towel under the door, very tight, and he waited. And he heard all this commotion after a while outside, you know. It won't go in, it won't go in. And so finally, after about five minutes or so, he opens the door, and there were several students there, and they said, oh, oh, I just wanted to turn this in so he can grade it. And J Joe took a uh, red magic marker, and he said, oh, I'll grade it right now. Zero, zero, zero. They were due at 10 o'clock. <laughs> but he did say nobody was ever late with a paper after that incident, so interesting. I knew a doctor, Dr. Ed Cloyd, who was a retired Air Force optometrist, and, uh, and uh, he finished an exam on a colonel one time, and the colonel said, Ed, Ed's writing the prescription at the end of the exam, and the colonel said to Ed, wow, you've got a really easy job here. All you gotta do is come up with the numbers. <laughs> and Ed was pretty smart. He said, yeah, it's just like baseball. All you got to do is hit the ball out of the ballpark. Because <laughs> uh, if optometry was easy, everybody would do it. Uh, and we sp literally spent four years getting to where we were. Picasso one time drew a uh, quick sketch for a lady. And uh, then she told, he told her how much he wanted for it. And she said, what? Uh, you, you did that in seconds. And he said, do you have any idea how many years it took me to perfect that technique to be able to do that in seconds? <laughs> Same thing's true of optometry. So in that interview uh, that I posted, uh, Lou talks about uh, Randy Beatty, and who was with him in Rochester for the optometry um, residency. And I got to know Randy later. He went he went to med school after uh, optometry, uh, became an oculoplastic surgeon. And Randy was the first ophthalmologist to deploy with me. I was the first optometrist to um, RAF Little Risington during uh, Desert Storm. So we went to this base in England, and uh, I really got to know Randy very, very well. This guy has the most incredible memory. When he went to med school, he told me he decided he just wasn't going to take any notes in med school. He sat in the last row and um, just listened. And I, I think they had a note-taking service. But he did great. And then another thing, he, he deployed to Asia for, I think it was a six-month deployment, humanitarian deployment. He took a couple of reference books with him, ophthalmology reference books, and they were stolen. So he said that he just relied on his memory for, for that. And, and he said, it's amazing what you can remember when you have to. <laughs> well, maybe he can. I, I couldn't do that. Just amazing. I did work with externs from uh, about half a dozen different schools, and that was a re very rewarding experience. So, uh, now some of the schools put us on the adjunct faculty. In fact, uh, Houston and uh, Southern even sent us uh, certificates, which is kind of nice. Uh, put that on your resume. One of the schools even listed us in the um, graduation announcement as adjunct faculty, which is kind of nice. But. Uh, Every single extern I worked with was, uh, was very good. I, I never sent an extern home. Uh, the schools do a very good job of uh, 
preparing the, the students before they go out to their externships. That was my experience anyway. Yeah, there were just so many great professors at uh, the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. Dr. Lombardi, Dr. Blaustein on the clinical side. I can't name them all, unfortunately, but uh, I owe them a, a big debt of gratitude, and I, I kind of wish I'd expressed uh, uh, myself a little more when I was in school.